Hi, this is James, and welcome to Inner Athlete Training Podcast. This is the Friday finale, where we take a look at some of the studies that we mine throughout the week to give you some of the latest on nutrition, wellness, exercise, meditation, all that kind of stuff. On this episode, we're going to get a grip. So we're looking at the British Medical Journal. Association of Grip Strength with Cardiovascular, Respiratory, and Cancer Outcomes in all cores Cause Mortality. Prospective cohort study of a half a million UK biobank participants. So what is this study telling us? It's very interesting because they did a study on what does grip strength tell you? Now, grip strength is usually an indicator of your overall strength, right? So sometimes you go to health fairs or you see these type of things where in, in addition to getting your cholesterol, your blood pressure taken, they'll have a grip thing. And then they'll give you an average you know, based on your gender and your age. And they'll tell you, are you, you know, average? Are you below average? Are you above average? So we've known for a while that grip strength is an indicator of your health, but this study went a little deeper. So the study shows that grip strength is strongly and inversely associated with all cause mortality and incidence of end mortality from cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, all cancer, all subtypes of cancer, including colorectal, lung, and breast cancer, with associations being modestly stronger in the younger age groups. Our results show that adding hand grip strength to an existing office-based risk score improves the prediction ability for all cause mortality and incidence and mortality from cardiovascular disease and that muscle weakness using previously defined grip strength cutoffs is associated with poor health outcomes. This indicates that the addition of the measurement of the grip may be useful in screening for risk of cardiovascular disease in community rural settings and in developing countries where access to biochemical measurements such as total cholesterol is not possible. Further work is needed to define how to use grip strength in this manner, in particular in non-British populations. So like I said, grip is everything. And what is grip? It's, it's, it's indicative of your strength. Right, so if you if you you were training throughout your entire life, there's a term called sarcopenia, and basically what that term is, it's it's the loss of muscle mass that naturally occurs as you get older, and this is personally like my biggest fear. Right, <laughs> I mean nobody really wants to use muscle mass, but the point is it's not it's not an invari it's not a definite sentence. Right, if you exercise and you're consistent with your exercise through your 40s and your 50s and your 60s and your 70s, you can stave off sarcopenia to a significant degree. That's a whole other study that we'll bring some studies into another point at another time because there's a lot of data on that and that's really fascinating. But because we're talking about grip and its association to muscle strength, we're, we're just trying to highlight the fact that uh, sarcopenia can be offset and if you, you just consistently do exercise throughout your age, throughout your lifespan, you will save a lot more muscle rather than just um, let it sarcopeniaize, <laughs> whatever you want to call it, what, or deteriorate off your body, right? Which is just what part of the natural aging process, but it can be delayed. And so when you're talking about strength, and we talk about this a lot on inner athlete training, strength is so important. It is so foundational to everything you do. In fact, I would argue that's probably one of the first things you should do, and regardless of what your activity is, whether you're a weekend bicycler, whether you are, you know, really into bowling, or whether you're into hiking, or you're a more aggressive athlete, more of a weekend warrior, more intense, or you're a professional athlete, obviously, right? So anything you do, strength will always improve your performance and make you more resilient to injury over time. And what they're saying now is they're finding grip strength again, which is indicative of your overall strength, goes a long way in looking at mortality, especially cardiovascular disease and certain types of cancer, which makes sense because muscle tissue is healthy, right? Muscle tissue is very metabolically active. So the more muscle tissue you have on the body systemically, I'm not just talking about working out your biceps, but strong legs, strong chest, strong back, strong shoulders. When you've really worked on this throughout your whole life, you have a lot of active muscle tissue and that active muscle tissue has a lot of um, 
so many medical benefits, so many uh, health benefits that it's too much to go into now. So we'll leave this one at that, just that indicator of strength, grip strength, because a lot of your strength starts with your grip, right? And, I, and I, this is when I, when I train people, I tell them this too. It's like somebody who wants to do a pull-up for the first time, right? It's okay to start just hanging. If you just literally hang off of a bar, a pull-up bar, you will start developing strength because you need strength to hang on to the bar, right? So if you can't hang on that long, you know, maybe you start with five seconds, but eventually you can do 10 seconds and you can do 30 seconds. But just that act of hanging, literally just hanging, is already starting to build a foundation of strength because you can't hang for a prolonged period of time and not be strong, right? So you can isometrically start developing your strength simply by hanging. And then you can progress it in a myriad of other ways and eventually get up to your pull-up. Yeah, it's one of the most exciting things, like as a trainer, like when I see somebody who just, they've never done a pull-up in their entire life and they're like 40 years old and they finally, we've been training it and they finally get up that one day and grab that bar and pull themselves up and over. You're just like, yeah. <laughs> so, but a lot of that comes down to grip strength. So they have, um, you know, any any time you do any kind of exercise, right? Whether you grab uh, the, the, um, the Olympic bar, to do bench presses, whether you grab the bar to do pull-ups, matters not. Your grip is everything because the the stronger your grip, the more you're able to grip. It's called the it's called the principle of irradiation. The, the more you're gripping, the more you're activating all the muscle structure, all the fibers, um, more neurological activation all throughout the body. All right. So it's important to understand grip is imperative to your strength, and strength is imperative to your overall health, not just for injury prevention, which is phenomenal, but there's all sorts of metabolic advantages to it as well. And if there weren't, then you wouldn't have the grip being such an indicator of uh, all-cause mortality conditions as they highlighted in the study. From Science Daily, more berries, apples, tea, may have protective benefits against Alzheimer's. Study shows low intake of bioflavonoid-rich foods linked with higher Alzheimer risk over a period of 20 years. This is from Tufts University Health Science Campus. Older adults with low intake of foods and drinks containing flavonoids, such as berries, apples, and teas, were more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease and related dementia over a 20-year period compared with people who consumed more of those items, according to a new study. So what are flavonoids? Flavonoids are basically a category of chemicals that are found in plants. And within the flavonoid category, there are subcategories, right? So you have uh, flavanols, which is what's contained in the apples and the berries. You have isoflavones, you have flavones. You have subcategories within subcategories within subcategories. But what they found is the flavanols that are found in the apples and the berries in this particular study had a profound benefit on offsetting uh, cognitive decline as you got older. Flavonoids as a general family of chemicals are very good at, uh, they're very strong antioxidants, right? They're very good immunomodulators. They're very good at immu immune stimulators. So the study goes on to say, flavonoids are natural substances found in plants, including fruits and vegetables, such as pears, apples, berries, onions, and plant-based beverages like tea and wine. Flavonoids are associated with various health benefits, including reduced inflammation. Dark chocolate is another source of flavonoids. So yes, dark chocolate is, can be a profound health benefit. Dark chocolate is actually quite healthy for you because it's got the flavonoids, but it's also got a lot of antioxidants in it as, as well. Some people like milk chocolate better than dark chocolate, but if you can acquire a taste for chocolate for your sweet tooth, you'd be doing great. So the study shows low intake of flavonoids, apples, pears, and tea was associated with twice the risk of developing ADRD. Low intake of anthocyanidins blueberries, strawberries, red wine, was associated with a four-fold risk of developing ADRD. Low intake of flavonoid polymers, apples, pears, and tea, was associated with twice the risk of developing ADRD. So if you don't know what ADRD is, it basically means Alzheimer's disease-related dementia, right? So they found that the consumption, the higher consumption 
of these berries and these apples and the flavonoids that are found in these uh, fruits goes a long way in, in preventing cognitive decline that may occur as a result of getting Alzheimer's or dementia as you, as you get older. And it, it was the same result with the Alzheimer dementia as well. Our study gives us a picture of how diet over time might be related to a person's cognitive decline as we were able to look at flavonoid intake over many years prior to participants' dementia diagnosis, said Paul Jacques, senior author and nutrition epidemiologist at the USDA HNRCA. With no effective drugs currently available for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease, prevention, preventing disease through a healthy diet is an important consideration. Now, when you see a lot of people experience Alzheimer's disease, you know, that's one of the things you have to look at carefully. Like, what was the sum total of their diet throughout their lifespan? You know, not what did they eat when they were really young or if they cleaned up their diet, the chances are they, they, they could have gotten better, right? But if, but if you had a pretty crappy diet for most of your life, chances are, like, especially there's a lot of studies out there saying like very high processed carbohydrate sugary diets also lead to Alzheimer's over time, right? So here... If you just nibble on your fruits, you know, if you satisfy your sweet tooth through apples, through berries, through different teas, and satisfy it that way, you're getting all the plant botanicals, you're getting all the antioxidants, you're getting all the flavanols, you're getting all the isoflavonoids. And those have very strong protective effects on the brain over time. Last study from July 15th, 2020, Veterans Affair Research Communications. Meditation was linked to lower cardiovascular risk in a large database study. The team looked at data on more than 61,000 survey participants. Meditation was linked to lower cardiovascular risk in a data analysis by Veterans Affairs Research and colleagues. The results appeared online on June 30th in the American Journal of Cardiology. Previous studies have suggested that meditation may have beneficial effects on a number of conditions. A 2017 American Heart Association scientific statement suggests that meditation may be of benefit for cardiovascular risk reduction. Data show that it may help with blood pressure, cholesterol level, quitting smoking, and overall cardiovascular health. However, the connection is far from definitive. By using a large national dat database with many participants, the authors of the new study sought further evidence on how meditation impacts cardiovascular risk. Now, this would make sense as a study, right? Because so much of your cardiovascular stress comes from the mind, you know, when you're chronically under stress all the time. That's why statistically more people experience heart attacks on a Monday morning. You know, they wake up dreading going to work and they have that experience. So the mind has a lot to do with this. We, we've covered this on other episodes and we're gonna continue to cover it because the mind can create a lot of stress in the body. They're inexorably linked, you can't separate them, right? So if your mind is always churning and you're under a great amount of stress, your, your body's gonna feel it. Considering all these factors, the researchers concluded that meditation is probably, quote unquote, associated with lower prevalence of cardiovascular risk. They note that while the results suggest that meditation can improve cardiovascular health, we would need a powerful study, such as a clinical trial, to determine whether meditation could benefit cardiovascular health in veterans. Meanwhile, the study adds to a growing body of research on the potential benefits of meditation. So this certainly is beneficial to study on veterans too. Veterans are experience a lot of stress. They don't always, you know, they go through a process of programming to go into fight and battle and they don't really go through a process to deprogram. They just sort of get thrown back into society and said, hey kid, you're on your own, <laughs> right? So that, that's an awful predicament to put them into. So post-traumatic stress disorder is big with, with soldiers and with other people as well who've experienced great trauma. So meditation will help quell the all the thoughts that eventually lead to the stress to the body, all right? So if you can kind of like get a lid on the thoughts to begin with that are all occurring in the mind and keep them from going down, flooding the body, flooding with the body with all sorts of like oxidants and toxins, because when you're under a lot of stress, 
whether you, you have a physical threat in front of you or whether you're just imagining the stress, the results are the same, right? You still release all sorts of chemical toxins in your body, you know, epinephrine, norepinephrine, cortisol, you know, all these things are released in the body, whether you are truly under stress or whether you think you're under stress, the results are the same. So you have a flood, you're flooding the body with these toxins. And that's going to cause damage, especially if it happens chronically throughout the day, every day, throughout a long period of time. You know, the body can only hold so much of that. Basically, our stress response was designed to initially outrun the saber-toothed tiger, you know, to, to beat up the person who might be threatening us, right? And then you sort of let it go and you move on with your day. The stress was like not really meant to be there chronically. 24 seven, but because of the way our society is structured now, especially now with COVID and people living under lockdown and losing their jobs, the stress levels are like really kicking up. So that's why meditation, that's why we emphasize this a lot on inner athlete training. It's the best antidote, you know, because it's certainly better than any drugs you get on drugs and they may help temporarily, but they're going to just set off a whole new cascade of issues and problems. So we suggest you look, really look into meditation and learn to meditate properly. And then you can at least start learning to relax and self-regulate on your own. And not only will you offset cardiovascular disease like this study indicates, but you will also help yourself stay calm and therefore offset a lot of other conditions, inflammatory responses in the body and that kind of thing. So this has been Inner Athlete Training. Uh, Friday edition, Friday, January 22nd, 2021. And we looked at grip strength as an indicator of all health, all mortality health. We looked at uh, flavonoids in apples and other fruits and teas and how it helps offset cognitive decline in Alzheimer's and dementia as you get older. And then we looked at meditation and how it could possibly help reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease over time. So we'll see you next Friday with more studies, more insight, because we're always looking at that material. Until then, we'll see you on Inner Athlete Training.